I very sincerely believe that we all who are gathered here, who are living in this era, are extremely blessed. We are very fortunate. Why? Because we are not only witnessing, we are also part of a great technological revolution that is taking over the world. See, technology keeps on changing. We all know that every day it changes. And it, it, it sort of keeps on evolving from one thing to another thing. Things keep getting better. But only very rarely we see technology taking a frog leap that changes the way it has been happening over the past multiple decades. I mean, for example, the advent of the PC, which brought the computing power from the mainframes of the world, from the data center onto the common man's desk. The advent of the mobile phone, which changed the way tech communication had been happening for the multiple centuries, I would say. And the advent of the internet, these are all changed the way we live, we have been living. And one such extremely fascinating and wonderful technological change that we are witnessing today and we are getting part of it is the change that we are witnessing in artificial intelligence. So what all things artificial intelligence can do today? I mean, it can play Go, I mean, which is a very big, uh, I mean, very complicated Chinese game, much more complex than chess, and it, 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 it started beating human beings, and now let's, like, like it, it easily beats human beings. It can learn to paint. Say, for example, if I take a picture of this gathering here, and I, I have a picture of, uh, mm, say, Ravi Verma, which are mm, Da Vinci, and I want this, this photograph to be painted in the style of that particular artist, a machine can do that. The next one is fascinating. It can compose music, all right? It can learn to walk, it can learn motor skills, it can write captions, it can translate, it can identify objects, it can identify if, if somebody becomes naughty and, and, and post the, my, my picture in, in internet somewhere, it can give me a trigger, it, it can do face recognition, and it can drive cars. All right, so, I mean, all this we have never heard about in the past, uh, re very re recent past, right? But now uh, the world is abuzz with it. I'm sure you will agree with me if I say that none of the computer technologies which have, we have been hearing has created so much of buzz and so much of ripples in the world as artificial intelligence is doing today. So what's happening? Let's chat about that for the next 13 minutes, four, 15 minutes. All right. Artificial intelligence is nothing new. You'll be, you'll be very surprised to look at this chart. It has been there from 1950s. And uh, machine learning, with the, which is a methodology to achieve artificial intelligence, has been there for several decades now. So, I mean, what is artificial intelligence? What is machine learning? To put it in very simple terms, as the, as the term, as, the, as it is self-explanatory, it is like you are coming out with methodologies of making the machine think and act like human beings. Simple, right? And then came deep learning, okay? So deep learning is a methodology of achieving artificial intelligence. It is a subset of machine learning. It's a methodology to achieve machine learning techniques. So how does it work? I always explain the concept of deep learning with one simple illustration. I always use this illustration and it really resonates well with, with the reasoners. How does a eight month old or let's say a 10 month old child understand that an apple is an apple? That's because the father or the mother gave the object called apple to the child and attached a label to it. He said, hey, Choto, this is apple, right? And nature has created our brains in such a fantastic manner that the child is able to look at, at the object. Its brain gets trained about the object. Okay, it, it, the brain extracts the features that are hidden in the, in the apple and also associates that label called APPLE, Apple, to that object. That is what it does, right? Now, if we are trying to do exactly the same thing and write algorithms that enable the machine to look at objects, look at data, and pick out commonalities and patterns that are hidden inside the data, and when a similar data, not the same data, when a similar data is presented to the machine, on a subsequent day, it is able, able to correlate to the training it had undergone the previous time and hence infer and hence understand that the new object 
is also as an apple. That is what is deep learning. Okay. Now, there is an intricacy involved in this. The child was, the complexity is this. The child was trained with a red apple, which, which was maybe this size, and uh, which had a different, uh, si uh, some shape. Whereas, five days later, you present to the child a green apple, which is much smaller in size, and shape is also slightly different, and maybe the stalk is also attached to the apple, and maybe some, a couple of leaves are also there attached to the stalk. But still, the child can identify the new object also as an apple, though it had undergone training using a different data set, right? Thank God, machines are not so intelligent, okay? You cannot train a machine with one image, or maybe a child needs few, I mean, maybe not one apple, maybe five, four or five times that it will pick up. Machines need a large amount of data, and you, the, and you, what do you do when, in the approach of deep learning, what exactly do you do? You create algorithms that enable the machine to look at data, learn from data, and take intelligent, actionable decisions, right? Very important words, intelligent, actionable decisions, which can hence be used for automating things, okay? Here we are talking about software writing software. Here we are talking about automation of automation. Okay, now that is what is deep learning. Okay, and deep learning works on the principle of something called as artificial neural networks. Okay, and it is in a way we are trying to mimic the way human brain works. Okay, and it's not a trivial task. I can stand here and say we, we are trying to mimic the human brain. I can say that. It's absolutely non-trivial task to do. I mean, you, uh, this is a small trivia here. The brain, I mean, I th think it's about two percentage of the body weight is, is the brain. But it consumes, at, at rest, it consumes about 20 percentage of the metabolic rate is consumed by the brain. And it's an extremely, extremely complex part. And uh, the way signals move from one to another, the way memory works, the way learning happens, the way we dream, I mean, many things, it's, it's extremely complex. And it's not possible to, I mean, it, it, it is not a trivial task. I stand corrected. It's not a trivial task to, to, to imitate it and make a machine do what you are supposed to do. Who would believe that, right? So how does deep learning work? So as I said earlier, it works on a principle called as artificial neural networks, wherein there are multiple layers of abstraction of features. And, uh, and as, as you progress, uh, deeper the network, as you can see on the, uh, on the screen, better will be the results. The basic level features, like maybe the, 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 the edges on the surface are extracted, and then higher level features, like say for example, if you're trying to recognize a face, the nose and the, and, the, and the eyes are extracted, and then the entire face is extracted, and hence it, it goes in, in a sequential manner from a layer to a layer, and, and deeper the layer, deeper the network layer, better will be the accuracy of the results. I'll start here, I'm, I'll stop here. I can go on on this for, Three hours, I don't want to get into that. I don't have the time to do that. Now, so how did this happen? How did this magic happen? What are the triggers to, for this to happen? I mean, this sounds, I mean, at least now we have understood what is deep learning. What happened over the ne past, let's say, five years, seven years, which, which has led to the rebirth of this technology called as deep learning? There are three major drivers. Number one, data became available in huge quantities. There is a deluge of data from two different channels. The first one is what we call as the social media. Just I'll take one, one example here. Look at the third example, YouTube. 300 hours of video get uploaded every minute. In other words, it's 50 hours of video every second. 50 hours of video has gone into the internet. Looks like people don't have any job other than uploading videos onto the internet, right? And look at the last example what we call as the Internet of Things. Everything is fitted with sensors today, from milking cows to rockets that fly into the space. Everything is fitted with sensors, and they create huge, huge, huge amounts of data. Now, so how do we do with this data? I mean, there's so much of data. So may, may I come out with a machine learning technology? That's the second trigger. May I come out with a machine learning technology that can you make use of the data, learn from the data, and help me to make decisions? Now, this posed an enormous challenge. There's a lot of data, a huge amount of data that needs to be processed, and obviously the, the, the complexity of the network that needs to go into processing the data, the algorithms that need to be written, are extremely, extremely complex. How do I manage this? For that, you need brutal processing power. 
which was not possible by the conventional processors that we have had. And that is where the GPUs came into play, the, G the graphics processing unit, which, which is a parallel processor and which can handle, because of the inherent architecture with which it is built, it can handle enormously amo big amounts of data and extremely complex models with ease. And so the, the availability of the processing power, then thanks to the new uh, technologies that are evolving, I mean, from NVIDIA, in which I am fortunate uh, to work for. Um, though, so these are the three triggers that led to the rebirth of um, um, deep learning. So I said deep learning can do almost everything, but how reliable it is, okay? So this is, I, I would encourage you to look at the first box. So the bottom, the black line shows the, the, the levels of accuracy that were uh, achieved by the conventional machine learning techniques, which, which sort of stalled at around 75, 76 percentage. And then came deep learning. And deep learning today can go up to, for this particular problem, I'm not telling that deep learning, uh, this, this level of accuracy is applicable for all deep learning problems. For the particular problem that I'm talking about, an image recognition problem, it can go up to 96.3 level, 3 percentage of accuracy. So it's 96.3 good or bad. Maybe 99 is good, maybe 95 is good. How do I decide whether 96.3 is good or bad? Because the, it is good, because the human levels of accuracy for that particular problem is below 96.3. So for this problem, machines can achieve a better level of accuracy than human beings. So 100% it is reliable. Now, where all deep learning is can be applied? Almost everywhere, to be honest. Well, for example, as I talk in English, if you want to hear this in Spanish, or Tamil, or Telugu, or Canada, anything, it is possible through deep learning. And medicine and biology, a big, huge area in which deep learning is getting applied. Um, take the case of a radiologist who has to look at a monochrome monitor from morning 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. for six days a week. It's, it's extremely strenuous and, 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 and um, I mean, maybe, maybe not enough radiologists are available in the world. Now, this is fast getting replaced by, by machines, which instead of radiologists, machines are trained to, die, to look at medical images Identify the aberrations and the lesions that are, that are, aware, that are visible in, a, in an image and hence identify, diagnose a disease. And then they are not going to replace the radiologist. The, the diagnosis made by the machine will be presented to the radiologist and the radiologist, the human radiologist, will either accept or reject the diagnosis made by the machine. It's wonderful. And this is giving four very big implications, particularly for developing countries. Maybe not enough radiologists are available everywhere. So how do I... How do I complement the, the efforts of the knowledge of a, of a trained radiologist and a machine to work together for the betterment of the humankind? That is what it can do. Security and defense, all the smart city projects that we are talking about, everything that we are talking about, it's all thanks to deep learning. If, let's say, a child goes missing and uh, the child was spotted walking in the platform of, of a railway station 150 kilometers away, if yeah, an intelligent camera can look at, capture the picture of the child, and it can compare the, 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 uh, the photo of the child which is available in the data bank, and hence identify it is the same child and create a trigger and tell that, hey, you need to go and pick up this child at this point. Okay, all these things are possible thanks to deep learning. The, the smart cities that we are all talking about, all of them are becoming better and better in terms of the technology thanks to deep learning. Now, cancer research is an extremely important thing in which deep learning is getting applied a lot, okay? And uh, multiple things like discovering the uh, cancer's genetic signatures, predicting cancerous protein formations. We're not talking about doing a postmortem after the thing has, uh, has, has, has happened. We're talking about predictions, intelligent predictions, automating pathological reports to find cancer biomarkers, etc. All these things are becoming possible thanks to deep learning. So the eye of the needle is two million nanometers in, in, in terms of the size. And a semiconductor defect is 10 nanometers. I mean, look at the numbers. 10 nanometers doesn't ring a bell, but when you compare it with the size of an eye of a needle, you'll be able to understand. And a 10 nanometer defect in a semiconductor can be picked up through deep learning technologies. Intelligent recommendations, chatbots, presenting to you recommendations that suit your needs your tastes, predicting what you will buy. When you walk into your store, understanding which shelf your eyeballs are residing a lot, and hence ensuring that 
that, that gets the right product. All these things are, are possible thanks to deep learning. And the retail area is, is, is becoming abuzz with multiple applications using deep learning. Now, is it, is it all only technology? No. It is also used for multiple social good also. Take the case of this. Using satellite imagery, it is possible to map the way poverty has spread over a particular area for in developing countries, thanks to deep learning. You can recognize the uh, geological disaster that is about to happen, that is impending, once again picked up from satellite imagery. A deforestation effort that is happening. Say, for example, thousands of satellites are, 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 are roaming all around the Earth. And if a small patch of forest has smoke coming out of it, before the smoke engulfs the entire area and becomes a natural disaster, deep learning technologies can enable a preventive maintenance, uh, preventive action to be taken to, to cull that. So deep learning has got a lot of social implications as well. And uh, in terms of technology, there are amazing machines that are, uh, that are being born. For example, there are purpose-built AI supercomputers which can handle this complexity of data, this complexity of computation. Um, the one, I mean, there are, there are systems that can handle up to 960 teraflops of operation. This is, this is like 40 teraflops short of a petaflop. And people who are working in the high performance computing area would, would, would resonate, would, I mean, would find this fascinating. These are like amazing things. So it is not only the technology which is evolving, it is also the, the brutal computation that is needed to handle this technology that is also evolving at, a, at, a, at an amazing speed. So, to conclude, AI is the path for tomorrow. And it is time to get started. There are, I know there are a lot of worries about will you take away jobs and all. If you ask me that question, if I say no, then I'm a liar. I'm, I will never say that. But then we have two choices. The first choice is to whine about it, get worried about it, get scared about it, and stay away from it. The second choice is to understand it, embrace it, we go along with it and we take it along with us and hence be on the bandwagon.